on World News Tonight. Construction calamity. India mourns the loss of dozens following a deadly crane collapse on an expressway project. Hope on the horizon. Eurozone returns to growth following inflation drops. But what do price pressures hold for the future? Find out tonight. The road to the White House. Polls in the US kick off with a strong start for Donald Trump. And cows in color. The newest art installation in Mexico City amuses herds of visitors. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you are watching World News. We have an expansive coverage here for you tonight, starting off with the calamity in neighboring India. At least 17 workers were crushed to death and three others injured after a crane collapsed on a bridge slab during the construction of the third phase of the Samurthi Expressway in a Maharashtra's district. A crane collapsed above and under construction expressway outside the financial capital Mumbai, causing several deaths and injuring others. According to officials, the accident took place near Saram village under the Sahapur Tehsil, around 80 kilometers from Mumbai. The equipment that collapsed was a special purpose mobile gantry crane used in bridge construction to install precast box gliders in highways construction projects. Maharashtra Deputy Chief Minister Devendra Fadnavi said an inquiry has been ordered into the Sahapur accident. Soon after the accident, teams of the police, fire brigade, and national disaster response force were deployed for rescue operations. The three injured workers have been rushed to a nearby hospital for treatment. According to officials, at least six more people are feared trapped under the debris. The Samurdi Mahamag is a 701-kilometer-long expressway connecting Mumbai to Nagpur. Now on to the latest on the deadly suicide bombing in Pakistan. Islamic State has reportedly claimed responsibility for the bombing that targeted a pro-Taliban party's election rally. At least 54 people are dead in the town of Bajor in northwestern Pakistan after a suicide bombing targeted a pro-Taliban party's election rally on Sunday. The death toll included at least five children and left around 200 wounded. Islamic State in Khorasan province on Monday local time claimed in a statement that they were responsible for the bombing. I don't know what the cause was, but there was a sudden blast and within moments dozens of people were lying dead and injured on the ground. When we reached the convention and heard speeches being delivered from the stage, we were standing to welcome our leaders when suddenly a blast occurred and then we were not aware of ourselves. Sunday's bombing was among the worst in northwestern Pakistan in the last decade. Around 400 members of the Jamiat Ulama Aislam Party, a key government coalition partner headed by hardline politician Fazlur Rehman, were waiting for speeches to begin when a bomber detonated an explosive vest near the stage. Rehman appears to have not attended the rally. Abdul Rashid, one of the party's senior leaders, said the bombing was aimed at weakening the party but that, quote, such attacks cannot deter our resolve. Police had suggested in their initial investigation that Islamic State in Harassan province was a suspect. The Pakistani Taliban, which some analysts have suggested as possible suspects, distanced itself from the attack. The country's Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif called Remen to express his condolences and made assurances that those who led the attack would be punished. Meanwhile, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres also strongly condemned the suicide bombing. The Secretary General extends his heartfelt condolences to the families of the victims and wishes a prompt recovery to those injured. He calls on the Pakistani authorities to bring those responsible to justice. The UN chief also denounced all instances of terrorism and attacks against civilians, adding that he stands in solidarity with the government and the people of Pakistan in combating the scourge. Now, meanwhile, on a more financial note, the Eurozone returned to growth in the second quarter as inflation fell in July. But hopes that the European Central Bank might soon begin cutting interest rates were tempered by persistent price pressures in services. Clouds continued to clear in the Eurozone on Monday as data showed inflation easing and a return to economic growth. In a comforting sign for the European Central Bank, consumer prices grew by 5.3% in July. That versus 5.5% in the month before, extending a slow trend which started in the autumn. While it's still a far cry from a 2% target, the latest figures may help policymakers decide to skip an interest rate hike after the summer. 
Analysts say the further fall in inflation could point to a clear but gentle downward path. The ECB raised rates for a ninth straight time last week, but President Christine Lagarde flagged the possibility of a pause could a in high, September. Could be a pause. Stubbornly high prices for services and food, however, may mean that pause is short-lived. Whether to hike or not is a dilemma for policymakers. It could take until 2025 to reach the ECB's 2% inflation target. GDP data on Monday showed that economic growth in the eurozone is doing better than expected. The second quarter expanded by 0.3%, demonstrating some resilience in the bloc as it returned to growth. But that relief is unlikely to point to a strong 2023. Continued pressure of interest rates and a drop in incomes sees analysts forecasting a weak end to the year. And now we have grim updates from China as heavy rains battered the north, washing away cars and flooding subway stations, with millions of people in Beijing and its surrounding areas warned by authorities to stay at home. Wading through waist-high muddy waters, first responders in China's Shangxi province such as door-to-door pulling out residents to safety. Since torrential rain lashed the region, villagers have been trapped in their homes. Rescue efforts made difficult due to boats unable to navigate the narrow streets. Further east in Hebei province, firefighters race to rescue trap drivers and passengers as the water continues to swell. And in the capital, Beijing, hundreds of bus services have ground to a standstill, with subway stations inundated. Authorities have raised the heavy rainfall alert in the region to the highest level, warning of floods, mudslides and landslides. China has been battered by the deadly storm dog Suri, which made landfall on Friday after sweeping the Philippines as a typhoon, bringing howling winds of up to 175 kilometers per hour. Over the weekend, the storm affected more than 880,000 people in coastal Fujian, forcing hundreds of thousands to evacuate and causing more than 478 million yuan, some 60 million euros in economic losses. China has been experiencing extreme weather conditions and has seen record temperatures this summer, events that scientists say are exacerbated by climate change. And starting from today up until November 2024, till a new president is elected in the United States, we at World News will bring you a special segment on the road to the White House. Tonight's update is on early polls where former President Donald Trump is dominating his rivals for the Republican presidential nomination, leading his nearest challenger, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, by a landslide 37 percentage points nationally among the likely Republican primary electorate. This is according to the first NYT Siena College poll of the 2024 campaign. Trump held decisive advantages across almost every demographic group and region and in every ideological wing of the party. The survey found as Republicans waved away concerns about his escalating legal jeopardy. He led by wide margins among men and women, younger and older voters. Moderates and conservatives, those who went to college and those who didn't. In cities, suburbs and rural areas. Overall, Trump led DeSantis 54% to 17%. No other candidate topped 3% support. The survey comes less than six months before the first 2024 primary contest and before a single debate. In an era of American politics defined by its volatility, Trump's legal troubles, his trials threaten to overlap with primary season, pose an especially unpredictable wild card. For now, though, Trump appears to match both the surly mood of the Republican electorate, 89% of whom see the nation as headed in the wrong direction, and Republicans' desire to take the fight to the Democrats. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis called for ending China's preferred trade status and suggested he is open to replacing Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell as he unveiled a sweeping economic agenda in a speech aimed at resetting his underperforming presidential campaign. I'm running for president because we need to reverse the decline of this country and restore our country to the greatness that it deserves. And that begins uh, by restoring an American economy that actually works for American families again. And Ron DeSantis laid out his plan for shoring up the American economy Monday in New Hampshire, 
as he tries to do the same for his 2024 presidential campaign. The Republican governor of Florida will refocus on smaller scale, more intimate events with voters, according to people close to him. That reboot is necessary after DeSantis burned through cash faster than expected since declaring his candidacy in May and having so far failed to put a dent in former President Donald Trump's roughly 30-point lead in Republican primary polls. China has become more authoritarian, more powerful, and more ambitious. DeSantis didn't mention Trump in Monday's speech, instead focusing his attention on a variety of economic concerns, including China. We've developed a dangerous dependence on Chinese supply chains, and our companies have been exposed to a hostile security apparatus. The elite sold us a bill of goods when it came to China. The new strategy of going small has an inherent risk, DeSantis himself. Even his allies acknowledge he's not known for his natural affability. To stay afloat, DeSantis needs to reduce his dependence on large donors. About two-thirds of the $20 million he raised in the second quarter came from individuals who have donated the maximum permitted amount and can contribute no more. DeSantis is hoping more intimate events, such as this New Hampshire barbecue on Sunday, will boost his small-dollar contributions, which is key for the health of his campaign. Last week, the campaign disclosed it had let go 38 employees in recent weeks, more than a third of the staff, hoping to keep a lid on costs. For the time being, the campaign will be trying to scoop up supporters one diner stop and lobster restaurant at a time, a process that even the plan's proponents admit will be grueling. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. The military junta that seized power in Niger has accused France of plotting military intervention to reinstate the deposed president, Mohamed Bazoum, as tensions in the region continue to grow in the wake of the coup. France has neither confirmed nor denied being given authorization to carry out strikes aimed at freeing Niger's ousted president, Mohamed Bazoum. That's after the military junta that seized power last week said on Monday that the government it had toppled had given such authorization. Here's Niger Army spokesman Colonel Amadou Abdraman. In keeping with its policy of seeking ways and means to intervene militarily in Niger, France, with the complicity of certain Nigerians, held a meeting at the headquarters of the Niger National Guard to obtain the necessary political and military authorizations. Bazoum has been confined to Niger's presidential palace since Wednesday. The junta has previously warned against foreign attempts to extract him, saying it would result in bloodshed and chaos. France has condemned the coup and urged that Bazoum be reinstated. However, it has not announced any intention to intervene militarily. Asked about authorization for strikes on Monday, the French foreign ministry said the only authority it recognizes is Bazoum's and that its priority was the security of its citizens and facilities. On Sunday, junta supporters attacked the French embassy in the capital Niamey. The coup in Niger follows military takeovers in Mali and Burkina Faso amid a wave of anti-French sentiment. France has had troops in the region for a decade, helping to fight a jihadist insurgency. But some in West Africa want the former colonial power to stop intervening in their affairs. Also in evidence outside the French embassy on Sunday, as has been the case in previous such protests in Mali and Burkina Faso, Russian flags. They are indicative of Western concerns that West Africa's latest military takeover could open the door for greater Russian influence in the region, as well as allow the Sahel's insurgency to spread. In other news on international diplomacy, Saudi Arabia will reportedly host Ukraine peace talks next month. Western countries, Kyiv and major developing countries like India and Brazil have been invited, but not Russia. 
Saudi Arabia is set to host peace talks in August among Western countries, Ukraine, and key developing nations, including India and Brazil. The meeting comes as Europe and Washington intensify efforts to consolidate international support for Ukraine's peace demands. The Wall Street Journal first reported on Saturday, citing diplomats involved, that the meeting would bring senior officials from up to 30 countries, which include Indonesia, Egypt and Mexico, among others, to the Red Sea port city of Jeddah, tentatively on the 5th and 6th of August. According to the report, Ukraine and Western officials are hoping the talks, which exclude Russia, will lead to international backing for peace terms favoring Ukraine. It's not yet clear how many countries will attend, but the report said countries that took part in a similar round of talks in Copenhagen in June are expected to do so again. Britain, South Africa, Poland and the EU are among those who have confirmed their attendance, as has United States National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Meanwhile, Russia has said it views peace talks with Ukraine would only be possible if Kyiv accepts the new realities, a reference to the country's claims to have annexed around a sixth of Ukraine. Conversely, Kyiv says negotiations with Moscow can only take place after Russia withdraws its troops. Ukraine has also previously said its 10-point peace formula should be taken as a basis, which further includes the restoration of its territorial integrity, the release of all prisoners, a tribunal for those responsible for the aggression, and security guarantees for the country. Arab nations have largely remained neutral since Russia launched the war on Ukraine in February 2022, in part due to their military and economic ties to Moscow. The world is reeling under blistering heat, with this July likely to be the hottest month on record globally. Millions in the U.S. are under heat warnings while a typhoon has hit northern China and wildfires are devastating Greece. For many in the U.S., it's just too hot to go outside. Tens of millions of people were under excessive heat warnings and oppressive humidity over the weekend, with the mercury rising well above 38 degrees Celsius in many parts of the country. The heat index reached 39 degrees Celsius in New York City, where the authorities encouraged residents to use cooling centers. It's, un, it's unreal. I, I can't believe it. It's too hot. It's just too hot. I feel like I can't go anywhere without sweating. You know, like, <laughs> I, I feel like I really makeup. can't go anywhere without sweating. <laughs> in the subway, the subway stations, is sauna, like it, it's free, but it's just it's, it's not. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> it's not feel good. <laughs> Not only individuals, but the heat wave is also taking toll on businesses as well. In Texas, which is experiencing record-breaking heat waves, those operating small and medium-sized businesses in the tourism, entertainment and recreation sectors, where many work outdoors, worked 20 percent fewer hours from mid-June and mid-July this year, compared to 2019 and 2022, according to an economist. And it's not just the U.S. China has also seen volatile weather this summer. Some parts, including the Xinjiang region, have seen some of the most brutal summer heat in recent years, reporting temperatures as high as 52 degrees Celsius earlier this month. China was also slammed by Typhoon Tuxuri over the weekend, with more than 31,000 people being evacuated from the capital, Beijing. Meanwhile, a total of 667 fires have broken out across Greece in the past 10 days, including 10 major ones. The island of Rhodes, known for its resorts, have been especially hard hit, with 20,000 vacationers evacuating the island earlier this month due to the wildfires. Welcome back up for more news. Let's take you around the world in a minute. An automated translation tool at Tokyo train station allows customers to speak to the train station attendant over microphones while the semi-transparent screen between them spells out words in 12 languages. The Russian military said its anti-aircraft units had thwarted another Ukrainian terrorist attack and downed drones targeting Moscow, but that his interception of one drone caused it to crash out of control into the same high-rise tower that was also hit in a drone attack previously. To encourage Abu Dhabi residents to choose driverless rides, the UAE is offering free trips around Saudi Art and Yas Island on board the high-tech autonomous 
autonomous models. Environmentalists in Japan's Fukushima prefecture voiced their opposition to Japan's plan to dump nuclear contaminated water from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant into the sea. State media reported that Myanmar's former leader Aung San Suu Kyi has been pardoned on five of the 19 offences for which she was convicted and jailed for a total of 33 years. The pardons would mean a reduction in her jail term of six years. And that is all we have for you on World News tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight in one of the busiest, most well-known avenues from Mexico City, where dozens of fiberglass cows took up their positions as their cow parade exhibition kicked off, amusing the crowds. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.